Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Cadigan, Associate Director of Alumni Relations and a proud member of the class of 2002. And wherever you may be Zooming in tonight, I want to welcome you to today's webinar event. My alumni office colleagues and I are so grateful to collaborate with Academic Affairs on this particular offering. And based on the response, there is a lot of interest in the brand new Prior Performing Arts Center here on campus and the creative offerings that are taking place within it. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Before I make introductions, I have some very brief housekeeping notes. We'll be together for just about an hour and we'll be joined by two terrific Holy Cross faculty members and three absolutely amazing student actors. They make all of us very proud. You're welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the discussion using the Q&A function on your toolbar. And we'll get to as many of your questions as time allows near the end. And before I cede the floor to our panelists, I wanna introduce our host, our MC for the evening, Kyle Frasina, Assistant Professor of English and Interim Director of the college's new Prior Performing Arts Center. Kyle has a lot on her plate. <laughs> Professor Frasina received her PhD from the University of Michigan and specializes in 20th and 21st century American drama and literature, as well as performance studies. And before being named Interim Director of the Art Center, Kyle had been serving as a dramaturge for the Ephigenia performance, and I'm hopeful she'll explain what that role is shortly. And I'm grateful to, for Kyle's support and collaboration with today's webinar. And it is my pleasure to cede the floor to Kyle Frasina. Welcome. Thank you, Tom, for that really lovely, um, lovely introduction. And, and welcome to all of you. Um, this is our first webinar event like this at the center. So you are the very first um, digital audience for the center's offerings, for the space. Um, getting to share it with you in this form is such an honor and it's really the kind of thing we hope to be able to do more and more of. So when Tom invited this um, opportunity to connect all of you to this exciting production, it felt like um, a really an opportunity we, we couldn't miss. Um, and I am delighted to be joined here by Mary Ebbett, whom I'll introduce in a moment, um, and also by these three wonderful students in the production of Iphigenia. Um, Tom asked me to say a couple of words about the center writ large and sort of what's going on six weeks into the semester. Um, so he's going to play some um, images so you can get a sense of what this gorgeous building looks like. Um, this is as you come up um, into the parking lot and the center kind of rises in front of you. Um, it's, it's a truly extraordinary building. Um, People have been commenting that it it feels remarkably um, uh, unique from other aspects of campus and that when you walk inside, you feel, wow, I'm in a different kind of space. I'm in a space dedicated to a different kind of thing than other spaces on campus. But at the same time, the way the center is built and designed, the, the, the windows on every floor, um, the, the views that are um, offered onto different corners of campus actually also make the building feel very much of campus. Um, and that is a real joy and pleasure of working in the building each day. So I really hope that among other things this webinar will do, it will spark your interest to come on down. Um, this photo here is showing the central space of the building, which we call the beehive, because it is and will be a, a, a real hub of activity. Um, the Around the beehive are a series of spaces. We have the um, flexible theater in which Iphigenia is being performed, um, and the students can talk a little bit more about what it's like to work in that space. We have here concert hall space, which is a 400 seat theater. Um, when you come to see that theater, I'm gonna um, remind you, it, you'll, you'll, you'll hear my words in your ears, um, to reach out and touch the walls of this theater, which you, we don't have a great shot of at the moment, but maybe one will come around, which are actually, they look like beautiful rippling stage curtains, um, of maybe some kind of like rich gray velvet. Um, in fact, they're made out of concrete and they're shaped in a way to reflect certain kinds of um, sonic frequencies. The kind of ripple is, um, is uh, uh, um, uh, adjusted to certain depths that make the sound resonate in the space in really beautiful ways. Um, 
In this building, we bring together the departments of theater and dance, the department of music, department of visual arts, the Cantor Gallery has been relocated upstairs. Um, we have practice rooms for students. We have rehearsal spaces for the um, orchestra, for the wind ensemble. Theater has been rehearsing in the building. It has been such a joy this fall to get to see it start to come to life and for more and more people from all corners of campus to say, hey, I have an idea, can I put it in this space? Um, and that's exactly what this building in all of its kind of transparency and intimacy in the, in the physical design of the space is really meant to do is, is, is to show all of us what it looks like to make art because we get to watch the scene shop folks at work we get to see into the costume shop um the practice rooms are open to the central space and to remind us that making art is a process there is time for failure there's time for experimentation there's time to feel like a novice there's time to feel like an expert um and that that kind of collaborative joyful playful experimental energy um is really at the heart of what happens in the space and we've already had a taste of that and there are so many um more exciting things to come so um, I think I'll I think I'll stop there, Tom, if that feels um, like a good introduction to to things to you, because I'm really eager to get um, into conversation with um, with Mary Ebbett, um, who is a professor of classics um, in the classics department here at Holy Cross. Um, she received her PhD from Harvard University and her um, research specialties are Homeric epic, epic um, and ancient Greek tragedy, making her the perfect um, uh, person to be translating the play for us um, this fall. Um, and one real focus of her work has been investigating the Iliad and the Odyssey um, as oral traditional epics. So sort of rather than simply words on the page as stories that were told over and over again, person to person um, out loud and what that kind of resonance means for our understanding of the text. So. Um, um, I'm really excited to um, get to share Mary's perspective on, on this project um, with you. Um, I can say very briefly because Tom asked that um, in my role as a dramaturg at the beginning of this process, um, I, I really um, acted in a very minor way, truthfully, as a um, as a, a, a listener to the ideas that Mary um, and director Ed Iser, who's wild, beautiful vision this whole production is, um, had for this storytelling and um, asked um, questions at moments that hopefully felt useful about the um, kind of um, development of the story and, and the choices that were being made about different aspects of its telling. Um, but the real stars of the show um, have been Mary and Ed, of course, and I'm sure the students will speak to what it's been like to be working under his direction um, this this semester. Um, but Mary, maybe we can, we can start by asking you to tell us a little bit about what this play is about. Um, it's called Iphigenia. Um, I, I, I happen to have an uh, inside knowledge here that it actually combines a couple of plays. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this story for people who don't know this particular really wild, um, wild, wild Greek myth. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Um, so right, this, our production um, called Iphigenia combines two plays of the ancient Athenian playwright Euripides. Um, he did not write them to be performed together. He wrote them at two different times um, in his career, but our act one uh, is known as Iphigenia at Aulis, and act two is Iphigenia among the Tarians. And there are two different parts of the story of this character, Iphigenia. And it is part of the larger tradition about the Trojan War. Um, so Iphigenia is the daughter of Agamemnon, and Agamemnon is uh, the leader of the Greek expedition to ma making war against Troy. Uh, when they um, are gathering their forces at the Greek city called Aulis, uh, they um, get stuck there. Um, they are trying to sail to Troy, and the winds um, aren't allowing them to do that. They aren't blowing. And um, the story is about uh, how Iphigenia, the daughter of Agamemnon, um, is made a sacrifice to the goddess Artemis in order to have the winds blow. And so it's, it's the story of how her father decides to do that. Um, I'm not, I'm trying not to give too much plot <laughs> for people who don't want it spoiled, um, but she is sacrificed. She is killed at the end of act one, um, in order for this to happen. Um, so how is there an act two? She, 
<laughs> oh, is there an act two? How is there an act two if she's killed? Um, so act two is one version of the story in which she is uh, saved by Artemis. Um, and some people think she saved, other people think she died, right? So um, the, her loved ones are left with some uh, uncertainty there. She's taken away by Artemis to the land of the Tarians, a non-Greek land, right? So nobody knows where she is, even though she has been saved um, from death. And uh, the, so act two takes place about 15 years later. So after the Trojan War um, has been completed, it has um, resulted in a Greek victory, but not really a great one to be celebrated because of the way the Greeks conducted themselves in that war. And, um, and other things have happened within Iphigenia's family. Um, before the start of Act Two, which is the story of um, Iphigenia's dealing with the aftermath of her sacrifice um, and her brother's arrival, her brother who was just a baby uh, in Act One and is now um, arrives. Um, they both think for various reasons that the other one is dead. And so they come to realize that they um, have been reunited and um, then some more crazy stuff happens. <laughs> they go home. <laughs> Again, it's hard to tell the story without giving it away. I think you've given a great synopsis. Um, I'm remembering in early conversations with Ed um, about his directorial vision for the play. He was trying to work towards um, sort of what felt like the um, the core um, sort of essence of this story. And, and one piece of it, as I'm recalling, um, among the uh, sort of multifaceted um, things that are explored in the story is the is of what it means for these two children to be grappling with the kind of aftermath of their parents of catastrophic behavior and what it means to kind of find each other in this in this moment and as a as a kind of a core arc I, I just find that unbelievably moving and I am so excited to see it brought to life by the by the students um you know I'm curious um you know the, just so that our audience knows and to sort of underscore a point that Mary made these plays have never been performed together. I mean, this is, it's really, it's really incredible. I mean, they're millennia old, like nobody in millennia, apparently, <laughs> as far as we know, has thought to put these two plays about the same character together. Um, and yet here at the College of the Holy Cross for the very first time, but we hope not the last, um, the stories are, are united in this way, sort of much like that brother and sister. Um, and I'm curious, Mary, what for you has felt like, um, some of the kind of important or exciting or thought provoking um, dynamics at play in um, introducing uh, your own translation of this um, uh, of these two plays at this moment in our um, in our our sort of our broader life and the life of the campus. I mean, I, I know there's sort of an interest in why this play, why um, mm -hmm. you know what what made, makes it so exciting to kind of open the center with this particular play. But I'm also curious sort of in your kind of thinking about these stories, which you know so well and have known for so long, what makes sort of adapting them um, a project that feels really apt for our time? Yeah, and I think both of those, um, you know, different ways of thinking about this play uh, do apply as to why this is going to be the first production at the new center. So what opportunities does the, um, does the center and its facilities offer for theatrical production? Um, and how would presenting a very old play in a very new space, right, bring those uh, opportunities out? And um, so I think that was part of Ed's, Ed Iser's inspiration. Um, was to see like, can we take something very ancient and put it in this very new space and, and bring those elements together in a new and exciting way. Um, and for me, Greek tragedy um, never goes out of style, but it, <laughs> it, um, because it asks questions that we still have to ask ourselves, right? There's what we see in this story is, you know, how do we know what what 
the gods, plural for them, but the divine really want from us as human beings. Um, how do we rationalize doing things that we know are wrong? Um, what do we choose to do when we are put in a situation where we feel like we have no choice? Um, and can we learn to live with the unacceptable and the aftermath of violence, either violence that we've committed um, or that has been committed against us? How does that change us? Um, and so this is a story that was told time and again in antiquity because they were wrestling with those questions too. And it could be told with varying details that I started to get myself uh, wrapped up in and just trying to tell the story, right? Why is Artemis demanding this sacrifice? How do we understand that? Um, but the, the story could vary on the level of even whether Iphigenia dies at Aulis or is saved um, and whether that makes a difference, right? In terms of how people deal with the, the very choice to sacrifice her. Um, and, um, you know, how do we, how do we justify the, these kinds of decisions we make, um, especially when we're going to war um, or committing other kinds of sanctioned violence? How does that distort our reasoning about other kinds of violence? And so there are these fundamental questions that every time this story is told, whether in antiquity or now, that, um, that we can, find ourselves wrestling with and, and having them resonate with um, situations on a smaller or larger scale that we have to deal with in our own lives. I, that's so beautifully put. And I, I'm really, I mean, I, every time you, I hear you describe this, I feel like there's a new kind of piece that I hear in, oh yeah, and this is why this, why, why this morning after today's news, this feels, <laughs> but yeah. that for, to, for whatever reason tonight, that, that what you just said about the sort of extent to which sanctioned violence, the state sanctioned violence, um, you know, Agamemnon is at war. He thinks he has to get his army home, um, uh, you know, or in this case to Troy and then home. <laughs> um, that How that sanctions other kinds of violence in in, in more intimate spheres. And I, I think mm -hmm. that that continuum, um, what we kind of open ourselves up to when we rationalize one versus the other is um, just a, such an important question. Um, you know, I, I opened in, in, in introducing you by saying that you've spent a lot of time as a scholar um, thinking about these, these epics as performed pieces of work, which is distinct from other, what other ways perhaps to approach these texts. Um, uh, and I'm really curious for you to share with the um, audience what it's been like to um, adapt these works, to, to translate them and adapt them, because you're doing both. It's you've you've mm -hmm. done a you you began with as I, I was lucky to be witness to this a kind of a literal translation from which you built up um, the kinds of bones of the story that felt um, sort of most essential to you and Ed um, in this particular version. But I'm curious what that process was like translating. From the Greek as you do all the time in your <laughs> sort of daily practice as a scholar of classics, but knowing that you are building this thing for these students to come do it really live in person for an audience. And I'm wondering what after a kind of a lifetime of scholarship where you've been thinking about this question from the other end, what it felt like to be making collaborative theater uh, in this context. Yeah, so it definitely was a very different experience. And um, the it was a it was a collaborative um, process throughout. We started from from Ed Eiser's vision for the production um, and including his idea to combine the two plays into one and thinking about retelling Iphigenia's story for a contemporary audience. Um, and you know, translation can do all sorts of there can be many different purposes for translation, right? And and even as I am teaching, you know, Greek 101, we talk all the time about translation is not word substitution, right? We don't just say this word means this and, you know, you just replace a word. You have to think about communication um, and how different languages express ideas. Um, and trying to first understand it in the original language as best you can, 
and then thinking through, well, how does the target language, in this case, my own native language, say those same things? Um, and that's it, that's a lot harder than than it seems, or than it seemed to me. Let's put it that way. When it was somebody is going to have to say these lines out loud. Um, and an audience is going to have to hear them and process them in real time. They don't get to go back and read it again to try and make sense of it. They don't get to sort of stop and say, wait, what did that line mean, right? So, um, but it's also paired with the visuals. So we were always thinking, what is the audience seeing? What have they seen? What will they see as they're hearing these words? And so for me, not having worked in theater before, that was new and exciting. Um, and I was glad to be working with someone as brilliant and experienced as Ed, because I could rely on him for so much of, is this going to work, right? And how is this going to work? Um, and so, uh, so we worked scene by scene. Here's what the Greek says, as you said, here is a very sort of literal way of rendering that. Now, what are we gonna make it? How is that going to look and sound together? It's really thrilling to hear you say all that alongside these visual images of the students. And <laughs> you can actually see Ed in this scene, he's got his hands up. He's sort of giving some instruction there. Um, this is maybe a perfect moment to turn to our student um, Absolutely. Uh, panelists here um, because I'm so excited for you to meet them. Um, I'll introduce them really briefly. Um, we have, as they turn their screens on, um, we have Lauren Casey, who plays Iphigenia. We have um, Emma Kennelly, who plays Clytemnestra. So Clytemnestra is Iphigenia's mother. Um, and we have Brendan Ryan, who plays Agamemnon, who is the father who makes this unfathomable choice to sacrifice his daughter. Um, welcome guys. And, and I should say that they are all um, zooming in here from different spaces in the center. So you've gotten a, a taste of a little bit of this. Um, Emma is in that space that I was referring to as the beehive. So you can kind of see the staircase coming up behind her. Um, on the top floor in the very back is the gallery. Um, there's a sort of a bunch of media spaces behind her and the theater is, is sort of directly over her left shoulder. Um, Lauren is in the theater itself. Um, and Brandon is in um, one of our rehearsal rooms. And this room um, connects to the recording studio and it can do kind of really beautiful live recordings. Um, it's just they're, they're sort of each in a, a kind of a different corner to give you a little taste of the building. Um, these folks are all seniors. They've been involved in the theater program in different to different extents in different ways over their, uh, the course of their time um, here. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really just excited to, to give you a chance to hear from them. So so maybe we can start um, with, with your impressions and experience of getting to perform in the very first show in the Prior Performing Arts Center. What has this process been like for you this fall? Whoever wants to jump in. Emma, you get us started. Lauren had an answer. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lauren, you get us started. Emma, we'll come back. <laughs> well, hello. Um, yeah, I mean, getting to sort of christen the building with this, you know, not only is it, you know, an old show, but it's also kind of a new show um, in, in its conception, the way that we're all working it. It's really, really neat to be in, you know, this new production that no one's ever done before like this, especially, um, I know Emma and I were in the, the last show in Fenwick, so it's sort of like this full circle moment to be part of an ending and also part of a beginning. It's really, really something. <laughs> Brandon or Emma, do you want to jump in on your impressions? Sure. Um, kind of what I was, what I was saying earlier was, um, I'm very humbled to be like, uh, kind of presenting this show and giving it to people because there's so much work that's been uh, done and so much time and money and and thought invested into this building and into the play itself. Um, Mary and Ed have done more than enough when it comes to like their share of work and continue to work with us collaboratively um, in like the best way and couldn't be more thankful for the process with them. And then just like very humbled seeing like workers come and fix things um, and like put this building up uh, because, you know, the college has spent um, a lot of money towards like athletics and that's great. And uh, that comes or has shown like 
or come to fruition uh, throughout like a, our great athletic teams. Um, but like, it's really cool that we're using like our liberal arts kind of institution, combining classics departments with theater departments. And then like in a place that's been basically laid out for the students to uh, brand new and like the best facilities um, laid out for the students to perform and create as a collective. Um, and so just like, I'm just grateful to be able to make theater every day uh, with like awesome people. Really lovely. Your turn, Emma. Um, I think the biggest thing is it's really just interesting to be in such a like brand new space. I think especially with Fenwick, it was a really old building, which was really cool, but also could sometimes make things difficult. I mean, last year there are bats, there's a ghost, <laughs> ghost, you know, it's kind of nice to get a fresh new start. I don't think there are any ghosts in here, yet, which is nice. So that's been really cool. Really lovely. Um, can you maybe share a little bit about, um, uh, since Mary has given us such a beautiful introduction to the play and, and it's sort of the resonance of its themes, um, how you are connecting to some of the um, choices that your characters make, the, the sort of journeys that they go through, how are you connecting to this story and this, um, what you've all described so beautifully as this kind of new form in this new space? I think I, uh, something that immediately jumps to mind is that the first direction that Ed gave me when trying to give me an idea of what he wanted Clytemnestra to be like in the first scene that she appears was, oh, do you know who, who Kris Jenner is? And I, of course, said, yeah, yes, I do know who Kris Jenner is. And he said, like that, you know, proud, big, all for the cameras, because he's, he's put it into kind of a different time period. So we have cameras in this opening scene where, you know, Iphigenia and Clytemnestra are arriving for uh, the beginning of the show. And it was just this very big thing. Um, but that was the first thing that he told me, which kind of gave me an idea of, I was thinking of her as this kind of very much in the ancient sense of the ancient Greek play. And that pulled it right into so reality tell like a sort of big flashy reality tv star yeah <laughs> not been what you were thinking but felt like a really productive direction for you to go in yeah. for your character that's great yeah go ahead lauren um i think along that same uh those same lines these at least for for me and with iphigenia she is someone who goes through quite an arc in this um story from you know very innocent, naive little girl to someone who has seen the world at its worst, but also um, in its sort of, in its beauty in that way, like sort of in all aspects. So that arc is really interesting. So, you know, at the start, it's really interesting to, I've said interesting so many times, it's really cool to, um, you know, step into these shoes of someone who is so young, so um, idealistic, and then really see how that can be morphed and changed into something a little bit harder, which is really interesting as an actor to, um, to get to sink my teeth into. And one so, of the real beauties of live theater that you're, that you're making those kind of choices and changes as a result of what is literally happening to you on stage with these other, with these other kind of characters, which brings me to Agamemnon. Um, Brendan, how do you possibly play this role? You don't at all seem like someone who would sacrifice your daughter for the Greek gods. How do you get there? Um, well, you know, all of the work, when I first saw the script or the excerpt at least that was given to us for auditions, you could tell right away that it was just good writing. Um, very easy to follow. It had a flow, there was purpose um, and you can, something to connect with. Um, which really goes to show like Mary's and Ed's work with, with it. It's just beautifully written, which is great. Like as an actor, because it makes a lot of things easier for you and you don't have to play at emotions. Um, you can just kind of find yourself slipping into them. Uh, and so I guess it's not, how do I find myself? I've been looking up a lot of generals. Um, so 
I've been watching Patton, MacArthur, or been looking up uh, YouTube videos of General West uh, Westmoreland uh, walking uh, uh, through uh, soldiers and greeting and how they would greet. Um, I've been mostly just getting all of the the kinks out with like um, with what who who Agamemnon is and Mary has like already kind of done a lot of the work for me because she knows a lot of the motives of these characters and and their placement within the society and their familial their their familial placements and the relationships with with other each other or with each other um and so it's it's been great to have Mary like right next to you as like an expert and like specifically tell you like what your motives are and what you're thinking and 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 so it's honestly been it's been a pretty smooth, um, but I guess the, the challenging part will come in the next coming uh, weeks where, you know, you have to put your uh, rendition to the character and your memories and your experience. So, but that's, yeah, that's tell us, so, so tell us um, well, I, a couple of things that all of you have said, I, I sort of really want to dwell on for a second, maybe just ending where Brendan did with the, the real, um, the rare, the rarity of working on an ancient play with a living playwright and that you kind of getting that sort of um, those that millennia of, of sort of history um, embodied in Mary um, in her expertise as a scholar and and in this case most importantly as a playwright um, and and those two roles are obviously quite closely joined um, but tell us where you are in the process right now so these these beautiful photos are showing um, obviously you're rehearsing you guys are you the audience are getting a um, a sense of this wonderful theater, which has space for actors to move around um, the perimeter at a, a kind of an upper level. The seats in this theater are arranged um, in this particular production and sort of a stadium seating effect, um, but they, the, they can move. So you might come back to see a different show um, in the Burroughs Theater and the seats will be in a different configuration that better suits that production. But tell us where you are in your rehearsal process, like what's happening this week, um, what's coming up, um, sort of where are you in your own journey of making this thing to sort of give an audience a little bit of a behind the scenes work of how how these plays get made. Yeah, go ahead, Emma. Uh, so currently it is our October break. Uh, well, for other people, it's October break. For us, it's build week, uh, which essentially means we get here at nine in the morning. Uh, we have been doing kind of a warm up and then just a full work through of either the first or second act uh, and then working with uh, Jimena, are, she does uh, the movement, which is specifically very important for something like uh, the sacrifice of Iphigenia, which you've kind of seen pictures of it already, but whenever he's kind of kneeling uh, up to standing in that sort of formation is, it's a very physically intense scene that needs a lot of work done. So that's how we've been spending a lot of our mornings. Um, then we break for lunch and then it's, uh, people have to build the set, hence build week. Um, so the rest of us are kind of spread all around this place doing more specific scene work where it's either you're just trying to really get the lines down where most of us are fully off book at this point, but it's a matter of getting it to the point where there's no pauses in between lines. You're really listening to each other. It's much more natural, like you are actually having this conversation, not just thinking during your scene partner's line, oh God, what am I saying <laughs> next? Like actually being in the scene. So that's what we've been kind of doing uh in the afternoons and then at night ed shows us uh, a movie it's been uh, oedipus rex i think was last night uh and the the first night was trojan women i think uh, our fellow castmates are watching troy right now which oh gosh the past two but but kind of fun but yeah so that's what we've been doing all this week so far that's terrific um uh, anyone else want to add any um uh sort of color to this um picture of where you are in the process I think Emma gave a pretty great run, run down there. I mean, maybe a, a kind of a last question before we open it up for the uh, the chat. And I see there are already some good questions coming in. Um, is um, a kind of similar question to the one I asked Mary about um, why does this feel like um, such an important story to be telling right now? Um, what about this particular play in this particular moment is hitting you individually um, uh, as, as resonant in whatever way, whether it's personal, political, sort of um, local, more global, um, what feels um, urgent to you about this story? Yeah. I think for me, and especially with just the story of Iphigenia, this young girl who came 
you know, came to Alice with so much joy and hope and excitement for her future, only to have that future be bleak and ending up being very quite sad and taken away from her in that way, like mourning a life that could have been. I think as, you know, someone who came into college as a freshman with a lot of, you know, excitement only to have COVID hit, like right in the middle of it, sort of having that, you know, what was, you know, supposed to be this, you know, bright, bright thing sort of bleakened by a shared ordeal. Mm -hmm. I think the story of Iphigenia really, um, really replicates that, but also finds, you know, the hope in the future, you know, it's Greek tragedy, but it's not all uh, tragedy. <laughs> in fact, I I believe the um, the second act, which is you know uh, Iphigenia among the Taurians, is usually defined as a tragic comedy. So it's not really um, really a sad ending. There is hope. There is light, and I think that replicates what we as you know a world community have been through on a global scale with the pandemic and with rebuilding and trying to find normalcy, I think in that way. So that's lovely. It that is sort of what I think of when I think of this arc. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brenda or Emma, either of you wanna weigh in on that question? Sure. Um, I think this plays significant for a few, few different reasons, um, politically, uh, I think like it's it's really interesting to see uh, a political figure like Agamemnon uh, trust the divine and and uh, over his over his own family, even though he knows in his core uh, what he's doing is is wrong. At least my rendition, <laughs> maybe perhaps. But um, I think you know, it, it speaks to a lot of elements happening um, nowadays with uh, people trusting in uh, into the divine and maybe uh, partaking in, 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 in things that are uh, mostly the, the capital riots and, and, and sort of, you know, we, we live in a very politically intense period. Um, and I think it's this play is is kind of shining light on that a little bit, and it's shining light through the story of this family and kind of being in camera and uh, and it all out there for the world to see, kind of part partly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this play is just it, it's really um, it's re it's really showing and and telling. Uh, and when hopefully, if you can come and, and see, you, you'll see uh, kind of all the aspects that I think uh, it deals with, maybe. Yeah, thanks. Emma, what about you? Um, yeah, this play is really personally important to me because uh, my husband actually did just kill my daughter to get something <laughs> her blowing, so it's really helped me work through that, so yeah. I could see then where you, you really lucked out with the cast. Yeah, yeah it was kind of perfect. Yeah, I see that. Okay, well, um, on that note, um, I think we'll um, I think we'll turn to some to some questions. Um, uh, one, actually, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to combine um, together, and maybe I'll throw them this one first to Mary. Um, a couple of people who have asked about the musical elements. The students have referenced some of the singing, and um, uh, they were talking before we started about how beautiful some of the songs are. So, Mary, can you maybe speak to the um, choice to um, to turn some of the text um, into um, into song? And into lyric and, and what yeah. that has been like? Yeah, that's original um, <laughs> to Greek tragedy, right? So Greek tragedy um, was musical theater. The chorus um, that uh, is part of every Greek tragedy would be singing and dancing. Um, so when we think of choral odes, those are songs, right? And there were dances um, so the performing space for the chorus is the orchestra, but in ancient Greek, that means the dancing place, right? So song and dance were um, the one of the foremost elements of, of ancient performance. And um, so I think I saw, you know, what do you do with the chorus is one of the hard questions when you're trying to do a modern performance. Um, 
we only have certain references to what the music sounded like. We have even less evidence of what the dances look like. So we're not trying to replicate that in any sense, but we are trying to um, have the power of song and dance and movement that of course many of us enjoy in, in theater um, today as part of how we tell the story and Ulysses Locken that, that um, the students rep, uh, referenced who wrote the music, um, you know, has done just a fantastic job of um, bringing together, uh, you know, the, the mood that that sets and the way in which the chorus can be central in communicating um, the emotional, components of the story. Mary, I'm remembering um, a conversation with you in a, in a slightly different context where you were helping to explain to me that in, in Greek tragedy, this is sort of just to ask you to expand on the last statement you made that the that the chorus often is sort of the audience's guide to how to feel mm -hmm. about a particular moment. So um, I wonder if you could um, expand on any of the, um, the kind of choices that were made um, in rendering that text um, and sort of what what things you chose to to sort of combine in, in those right. contexts. Yeah. So again, we're trying to adhere to Euripides' words while also making it communication, as I was talking about last time, right? How is a 21st century American audience, we're not going to assume they have any experience with the story or with the, the form of Greek tragedy. How are they going to be able to understand and connect with these characters? Um, if they haven't had the personal experience that Emma just spoke of with you know, <laughs> the story, how are they going to, um, to do that? And song, I think, is a way to do that. So in looking at Euripides' songs that, um, that he had in these, there are particular images or sentiments that we thought this will still communicate, right? This will still be something that our audience will be able to um, understand how that is representing um, what is happening and, and the action here. And so um, in translating those, um, you know, we're using modern song conventions. So I did have to use a rhyming dictionary and make the <laughs> lines rhyme um, and, and try to use some of the central imagery that was part of Euripides' songs, um, but, you know, convey it in a way. And then again, it was magically transformed into beautiful songs by Ulysses, right? <laughs> Taking those words and the talent of the singers um, in the chorus and on the cast as a whole to, um, to really convey, um, you know, what, what their experience within the action of the play is. Um, one of the uh, two other questions that have come in that that feel related to to me, so I'll combine them, um, and and you four can answer as you will. But one of the questions is asking about um, how does the state, what does the staging look like? What are the some of the kinds of um, ways that you might characterize the staging? We've seen some really gorgeous images of them, but if you were sort of, and maybe I'll cast this first to the actors, if you were kind of describing the sort of qualities of the staging of this play versus other other pieces you've acted in at Holy Cross, how might you characterize that? And then a, a kind of a related question um, is how the new theater space itself is facilitating this particular um, interpretation of, of the story and how does that kind of physical um, trappings of this new environment um, helping to shape your, your storytelling in it. So I'll, I'll open that question um, really to any of you, um, but maybe we can get a couple of perspectives. Yeah, go ahead, Emma. Um, I think the first thing that jumps to mind is the fact that the new theater has uh, an audience on both sides. So it's like tennis court, seating almost, which I've never had to deal with exactly before. Um, so instead of getting to kind of know where you're acting to, and one of the one of the earliest things they teach you when you're like a child doing, you know, little musical theater plays is, oh, cheat out, cheat out to the audience so that we can see you. We never want to see your back. Well, there are some times where inevitably somebody is going to be looking at your back in this space, and you are constantly having to think about the fact that 
all around you, people are getting different angles, but also that means you kind of want to keep moving almost a little bit more because then you can, you know, let people see you. And also you have the two sides constantly. So weirdly, the best way for the audience to be seeing you is if you're kind of sideways, they can see the two sides of your face. So that has been really interesting to adapt has, to. Well, has Ed shared with you, um, and I'm trying to remember, Mary, maybe you may remember this as well, um, sort of about, because again, the, the theater can can take many different kinds of configurations. So so um, what was the choice in, to put it in this sort of tennis, um, you know, stadium seating kind of style for this play? Yeah, Lauren. Now, I'm not sure if this is the exact reason, but I think it's really interesting interesting so many times but how the audience is right there with you I mean you the audience you know you can see behind me that you know this is right where the seating ends and I'm sitting on the stage right now at a table and I mean you're right there so I think have the choice to have the audience be on either side really puts them in a way both on the outskirts of the action but also right in the middle of it they are constantly going to be exposed to, you know, a lot of the same things that the actors are going to be exposed to in that sense of, you know, all encompassing um, action and drama. And so I think that's a lot of the reason why um, the audience is on either side. So Someone can... asked, is there a lot of blood in the show? Um... Yes, it's an Ed Iser production. There's a lot of blood <laughs> in the show. Have you been rehearsing with blood yet or is that all still to come? No, not no. yet. <laughs> um, definitely excited to start working with blood. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, very messy, but that's what the process is. It's messy. It's hands-on. And yeah, I'm very excited to, to start working in the, the blood aspect of it. <laughs> Brendan, for you, what, is, what has felt... Um, kind of specific to the storytelling in this space or what stands out to you as um, particularly compelling about the staging in this production? I think I think Lauren really got the, the gist of it. Like this is a, it's a play and Ed made this very clear. It's a play about the chorus and uh, it's a play about this kind of, well, the bridesmaids and, and the Torian soldiers um, kind of being wrapped up in, uh, into this world and, and their following uh, and how like our decisions here kind of uh, affect them. And so I think like it just has to do with, you know, it's a collect it's a collective and it puts the, the audience right into the, the middle of it. And uh, honestly, some of the songs are just beautiful and uh, this space and the acoustics of it and the way people are going to be right next to it are, is really going to afford a great, great uh, chance to listen to some beautiful workings of Ulysses who produced this music um, and the writings of Mary and, and our workings are, I'm not, I don't really sing that much in it, but uh, <laughs> the workings of, of my castmates, because they've done a great job, so. Um, one of the questions is asking, um, it, it references specifically Our Town, but, but um, uh, Brendan, applying also to you and any other kinds of um, more contemporary drama um, you've done. And Artan obviously isn't a play from 2022, but it is in a, in a 20th century idiom. Um, uh, can you talk about Mary's Mary's text really beautifully blends some um, kind of um, ancient phrasings and rhythms um, and um, sort of narrative arcs with contemporary language. Um, uh, some some more boldly in, in places than others. And I know that was a process that that Mary, maybe you can also speak to kind of what that balance was like. The, the kind of question is also, what does it feel like to be to be performing sort of does it does it feel different to you as an actor? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, um, to be stepping into this ancient text um, in a contemporary interpretation versus a play that you know was written, you know, just a hundred years ago. Yeah. Emma. Um, I think there's a really good example of this today during rehearsal of for me, when you're approaching a lot of the modern plays that we've done, everything about the characters is going to be in that text because that's the only thing they exist in generally. Whereas when you're dealing, especially with ancient Greek texts, that character could be in a million other plays and texts and interpretations. And there are established things about that character, 
relationships, uh, where their story goes after and before the play that you just would not know as an actor reading your script if you didn't have the classics background or you did you know, research you didn't even realize you had to do. This might sound obvious, and if I'm about to come off as ignorant, I apologize, but we uh, were just doing a scene where uh, right before, we, we, were, we were practicing a, a scene that happens right before a song that Lauren and I sing, and one of the lyrics that I mention is, it just says, hateful sister and then hateful husband. I'm pretty confident I know who the hateful husband is in that song. I had no idea who the hateful sister was. I didn't know who Clyde and Mesh's sisters were, who whatever, and then Mary clarified for me, that's Helen, that's Helen of Troy. She's the one who has caused this whole thing for you. And I, you know, we then, you know, added something in earlier to kind of help that, but it was realizing there's so much more going on just with your characters. That just totally slipped my mind. I just kind of accepted like, that must be someone that I just <laughs> don't know who that is. You know, that's the kind of thing that never would have happened in, in, in our town, for an example. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, you're not going to get some sort of naturalistic style uh, like Marlon Brando in Streetcar Named Desire, <laughs> but you, you're going to get like something kind of close to Shakespeare. Ed has, has talked a lot about um, kind of like relating to us about like the Shakespearean language of it all and kind of the monologues that, uh, well, actually, I think, uh, I think, Emma, do you have, a, you have a monologue to the crowd, right? Or soliloquy? Yes, I do. Yeah, so there's like a few soliloquies to the, to the crowd, which is um, very like Shakespearean too. Um, so it, it's definitely, it, it's very expressionist, uh, very, a lot of symbols, um, but it's rooted in, in realism. Um, so it, it's been, been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, to speak to that, I think, with something like Our Town, which was the last play that was in Fenwick Theater before we, you know, moved into the new building, you know, that is a sort of play that is, you know, universal themes of, you know, family and just things that, you know, you might encounter, even though it's not technically modern, it's set in the early um, 20th century. And obviously, this is set technically not our production, but, you know, in antiquity, in antiquity. Um, and despite being set so far back and being written so far away, those themes of family and loss and grief are all very modern in that way. Humans are humans wherever you go, whenever you go. Um, and I think it's really interesting. There's that word again. <laughs> it is interesting, Lauren. No reason to apologize. <laughs> but um, to explore how these very modern and very relevant sometimes painful, sometimes beautiful, emotional truths translate from that ancient text to this modern day, which I mean is, it's beautiful. It's really, really awesome. Um, the panelists have rightfully um, observed that you, I mean, sorry, the audience has rightfully observed that you students are extremely impressive. Um, and somebody asked what majors you all were. Um, and I don't, I know a couple of your majors, but I don't remember all of them. But I wonder maybe if we could kind of close by, you're all seniors, you've, you've kind of come to this exciting moment in your Holy Cross career. Um, what does it feel like to be sort of a, a kind of arrived at this place thinking about what kind of other education you've gotten here that um, is leading to your ability to perform in the play to show up for each other in this way. Um, but if you're kind of reflecting on your academic journey, as it's helped you arrive at this, this moment, maybe you can share a little bit about your kind of own backgrounds here as our final question. Go for sure. it. Lauren. Or Brendan, either way, either way, we'll, we'll make the rounds. Um. I'm a theater and English double major with uh, creative writing um, as a concentration. Um, I guess I'm learning every day, uh, specifically nowadays when you have Ed and Mary and, and Lauren and Emma all around you. So, uh, but I think uh, I, uh, I'm, I do like some creative writing for the Purple Magazine. Um, I do some acting. I'm a little bit everywhere but um i don't know i i i mean i enjoy this play all i think about when i uh, and is one thing at a time <laughs> so i'm mostly just thinking about this play this is the <laughs> and, uh, season that's really nice 
Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, so I am a theater and sociology double major. Um, and I think, you know, being someone who loves to, to study the ways in which society work and how people work within those societies, I think that translates really well to theater, getting to step into people's shoes in both, you know, this creative, fun concept and also in a research aspect. I really enjoy it and I think that it applies well. And so, uh, like Brendan said, you know, uh, we think about one thing at a time. So <laughs> definitely this takes up a lot of my, um, my current schedule, but what, what a way to, what a thing to be doing, right? <laughs> What a way to spend the day. Um, Emma, what about you? Um, I'm a double theater and history major. Uh, I kind of half forgot the question, but somebody else asked about where we were living and I live in Williams. And yes, it is a really difficult walk up here. You walk across the entire hill of the campus every single time and you think 10 minutes is enough and then you get there and you're a minute late somehow every single time. No. It's a workout though, so I'm, I guess. Really, I'm interested in that all of you students have, um, you are so committed to theater and you're also bringing to your work as actors, these other disciplines, these other backgrounds, other content knowledge, um, but also maybe it sounds like ways of learning. Um, and it's just been a real privilege to get to um, hear you talk about this play and this process um, and made me all the more excited for um, getting, I, I, lucky me get to see, Mary's been in rehearsal the whole time. I'm gonna get to um, duck in for a run through on Friday. Um, and then we really hope that at least some of you in the audience will be able to um, travel um, or, or join us more locally for the, um, the run in November because it is going to be gorgeous and shocking and surprising and heartbreaking and, tragicomic in moments. Um, and uh, it's just gonna be really extraordinary. So um, Tom, I'll turn things back over to you for our kind of final words here. Um, but really thank you to Mary, thank you to the students. Um, and most of all, thank you to um, Tom for bringing us together and, and to all of you for joining us. I, I just want to extend those thanks to, to Kyle, Mary, Lauren, Emma, Brendan um, for, for sharing their time, their knowledge, their perspectives with us today. And I also want to thank Professor Ed Iser, yes. um, Ephigenia's amazing director, whom, whom we referenced earlier, for his constant support of drama and the arts here at Holy Cross. Um, he has been a rock and we are very, very grateful. Um, and we hope to continue offering more of these webinars for alumni, for parents, and for friends in the future. Um, but in the evening, but but in the meantime, have a great night. Thank you all for joining. Thank us. you.